Hello everyone, happy 2019 and we start this year with the story of the Burgundians, the Highlanders of the Migration Era. Um, so recently I noticed that uh, the Migration Era um, themed videos I make have uh, relatively good um, success compared to, to, <laughs> to the other ones and therefore I decided that when I have a um, bit of day off, uh, days off, I, I will try to actually mm, divert from the usual mm, one video about general medieval history and one other, another one about military history and discuss uh, one of the peoples of the ancient world or medieval world uh, as well. Um, and uh, at the moment I want to complete this list of migration era peoples so that maybe someone who goes out there can't find them easily. I I noticed that I think for it, it actually a uh, grammatic uh, coincidence, but there are very few videos about the migration era <coughs> said this way. Um, it's either the migration period of the age of migrations. Um, <coughs> pretty sure in English I've found migration era uh, commonly used, but I don't think it's the most common term to define it. So every time you um, you 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 type migration era uh, <coughs> on YouTube. Uh, my you notice that my videos pop up because they are <laughs> among the only ones that uh, that actually have that uh, the title or that term uh, into the description, and that made me uh, make a lot of views. But I don't think it's just accidental because I watched also the video length in the in YouTube statistics and I realized that basically all the videos I made about migration era rocketed at the top of the red, rather half the list of uh, videos I've made and <coughs> this made me reflect because of course I'm happy if I can write uh, excuse me, write, <laughs> if I can talk I, I usually write a lot during the day so that's uh, the lapses where the lapse stems from, but I realized that every time you talk about a migration era, people are more prone to listen to that. So probably you are interested about the period. And today we talk about the Burgundians, in fact, um, who are, I can't say a relatively secondary people of the migration era, but you know, the really big ones were the Goths, usually the ones that were more powerful than achieved more, than the Franks that although um, probably not this, this huge force at the beginning, when they <coughs> seized Gaul and the Merovingians took over, definitely built up the most powerful um, actually not even kingdom, but, uh, but an empire, the migration era then also the long birds um, <coughs> founded the long lasting uh, kingdom differently from other kingdoms the anglo-saxons had a also a, arguably even a longer history considering that they basically uh, ended as as um as an anglo-saxon uh, political and uh, um let's say an independent entity until uh, until 1066 um but the Burgundians uh, also had a relatively short story um, in the sense that the kingdom they founded into southeastern France actually went on like others, a bit like the Alemanni and all. But, but eventually the Burgundians are a bit of one of the forgotten identities of the migration era. Like wh while in southwestern Germany the Alemanni, although also in there, conquered by the Franks and eventually um, Frankicized. Uh, um, kind of remained as a sort of an ethnical uh, identity. The Burgundians kind of, yeah, I mean, I'm sure, pretty sure in southeastern France, Burgundians have influenced local, um, up to this day, uh, local traditions and, 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 and language and all. But, I, I, I mean, it's not this huge um, identity we remember, histo historically speaking. Like Spain with the Visigoths being like that was a kingdom, Italy with longer birds, um, <coughs> even um, you know, especially France has been kind of monopolized by the Franks because um, they had this huge influence eventually over these other uh, Latin Germanic uh, entities that had existed all around, so that basically they became a sort of the, what is called in German historiography as the Teilreich that is literally a, a piece uh, a, of the uh, of the e empire rather than 
um, <coughs> um, let's say, uh, parallel, um, um, comparable identities on their own. The Franks, for instance, rec recognized the, the Longobards as their peers, uh, and, the, and the, that was the only case in which they, they, they did such a thing. Um, for many reasons that now we don't discuss, but these other kingdoms kind of mm, fell into, um, relatively into, um, into, mm, can't say, mm, um, to be even into forgetfulness, but uh, um, they, by losing um, early, their political autonomy kind of got simply a, an extension of the uh, of the Frankish Empire, or the Merovingian Empire, and, and eventually the Carolingian. Because uh, especially before the the um <coughs> The, the rise of the Carolingians, these entities, albeit um, still half Frankish at that point, especially in their aristocracy and half of, of the local ethnicity, had enjoyed a certain degree of uh, autonomy. Then the Carolingians sent this other wave of, 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 of Frankish counts there and kind of uh, altered the situation. Th that's why mm, you can't really say that there, there's been a real continuity in, in, in there. Uh, but aside from aside from this, I'm <coughs> talking about the Burgundians since the origins. Um, so I named them. I, I'm attaching this kind of tribal um, names to to the titles. How were the Burgundians the Islanders? Well, simply because the the name comes from Bergen. That means this uh, a high place, the mountain, essentially. And um, I, I I admit I haven't done a really a thorough uh, search, but uh, I think that we don't know really much more about the origins of the um <coughs> of the Burgundian ethnonym. Um, um, we I think the Burgundians enter into the um, into the Roman sources quite rather late, around I think the third century, and the the Burgundians were already called in that way, and I think that no other a substantial even origin about the people have survived so w differently from what other we, we can do with other Germanic peoples we really can't trace back their ethnonym to a found myth or something like that uh, if I'm wrong pre please correct me but um, this is uh, sadly the, the really the average of the um, awareness we have the historical awareness we have uh, about the, the these population's origins, and <coughs> we are very lucky generally if we, if we know more. Uh, so it might as well be that I don't know this population was founded. Uh, um, ex let's say, what a, what a bad term to to put it. Let's say that this population was named um, because at a certain point they settled close to to a mountain. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty pretty silly interpretation, but we don't really know. And as a matter of fact, the um the the origins um of the um uh, of these um uh, of these people can at least be traced usually what is being done to the uh danish um i mean the first place would that can bear uh, a burgundian eponym is would be the danish baltic island of uh bornholm which is just in the south of Sweden, by the way. So it, it, it's really um, much closer to Sweden than than to the Jutland Peninsula, and that's where traditionally we think that all these peoples came. I mean, from Scandia, from southern Sweden, where they crossed into eventually the the continent. And definitely, other populations took other paths. Surely, others passed through Denmark. Uh, <coughs> through the Jutland Peninsula, but generally speaking, we we have in several, um, because of a sum of, re of of hints that now we can't re, um, we can't talk about that uh, most of this population took that that uh, that uh, that crossing between Sweden and today's roughly northeastern Germany or Poland. And especially the, the Burg and, and and we have this name of Bornholm would would be um, the essentially the the um, in etymology the uh, the the island of the Burgundians um, the <coughs> uh, um, the 
the, the in, in uh, ancient Norwegian the um, the island was called Burgundar Holmer I believe um, <coughs> if the pronunciation is correct and uh, there are um, um, and and the name of uh, of Bornholm also recurs in other in other sagas like the uh, Thorstein's saga Vikings Sonar, uh, where uh, Vizetti, um, uh, where uh, Vis Vizete um, established in in an island Holm. It's actually Holm. I, I think it's a, a pretty standard term to define hi islands in that language. Um <coughs> and one, however, is named was Bergensholm. So that kind of, and um, but uh, we we really don't know much more. It, it's just a scanny um, evidence that doesn't tell much. When you study the, the origin of the Germanic populations, you realize that most of the times it's all uh, complete speculation where these guys came from. Generally speaking, we have a common tradition that wants them to have come from Scandinavia, which is definitely tru true, but. Um, it, it must be considered that uh, the ethnogenesis of the populations, especially that that, that um, took um, that, that began the march into the migration era, were um, <coughs> were much more contingent to to Central Europe in many ways. At least from a demographical point of view, there might have been an originary Scandinavian core, but the majority of people uh, of people that that, uh, that were in the march uh, during the migration era actually came from literally lots <coughs> of different peoples. It was an extremely multi-ethnic thing. Uh, there were Germanics, Iranians, um, Iranians mi meaning the Shitsins and the Sarmatians and their hairs, um, Turks, uh, Romanized were not openly Roman population, so um, it, it, in, in relatively to the migration era proper it doesn't even make a great sense. The, the origins of the migration era peoples are, are something that people wa that that scholars wonder in, in a much earlier time. Um, it's essentially two or one or two centuries before Christ when there has been the major push of the Germans towards uh, the, the Celtic South into to what is today <coughs> essentially uh, Germany proper. At least northern central Germany because southern Germany was uh, Celtic um, <coughs> and remained Celtic at, until the migration era in practice but even there it was it, the, the Germans were really a few compared to all the people w who uh, were already inhabited there. Excuse me, I drink a little. <coughs> Even though, relatively to the last point, and definitely those areas were, <coughs> were at that point really depopulated, so probably even if the Germans were a few, they still made um, some impact overall from 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 a demographic point of view, especially in these central European lands that were really poor. While uh, I don't know in Gaul or Italy or Spain, um, obviously there were millions inhabiting there, so it's not that the Germans ma made this huge impact. Um <coughs> uh, if not in certain cases, because also mm, yeah, also in there, not all the regions were were alike. Like northern France or northern Spain were or northern Italy were much less populated than, than the south, for instance. So in, it's in there, I think not surprisingly, that especially in the case of the Franks and the Longbirds, probably the greatest uh, ethnic impact was, was made. But aside from this, um, <coughs> it's, it was more of a cultural impact rather than a demographical one, which we don't not care about now. Um, so the um, for, for the Burgundians, like for the rest of the... Um, of the Germans, we uh, tradition has put uh, into their story as uh, Scandinavian origin. That is generally accepted. Um, you know, it's perfectly plausible um, that the Burgundians came from there, um, <coughs> and uh, they um, uh, relatively to Bornholm, we we see that there are uh, that we have evidence of, of a certain settlement of, of populations. We do not know who they were. This is the great problem with the, mi the origins of the migration era, that we have extensive archaeological evidence of what existed beyond the uh, Roman frontiers. 
Uh, the problem is that these uh, archaeological finds are not tagged, so we don't know to whom they belong. So what we have to do essentially to trace the history of these populations is to confrontate the classical uh, Greek or Roman sources uh, with the archaeological evidence, so that if the Romans said that, I don't know, uh, as, we, as it happened for Bur the Burgundians, that they dwelt in a certain place, um <coughs> then the, hypo the archaeological hypothesis crossed with the historical evidence is, okay, so theoretically these m might have been them. Hmm? But otherwise it's very, very difficult to, to look at that. Also, First of all, because Germany, or at least the Germanic populated areas, were quite crowded for, um, <coughs> for that environmental s um, standards. And the Germans were also quite, as you know, quite um, agitated. They, they, they moved a lot, they had a s sort of semi-nomadic um, <coughs> organi political and social organization. They um, they mixed a lot. They um, they definitely moved. So it's very very difficult to to trace. And we practically don't know anything about who was who in there until they don't come into contact with the Romans. Um, in the case of, of Bornholm, for instance, we see that by 250 AD, the, the island is largely depopulated. Um, <coughs> we see that mostly from cemeteries, because that's the only place where these, um, I mean, that's the, the privileged area where we can find uh, um, archaeological uh, evidence. Um, but uh, evidently, who had inhabited there uh, in previous times had migrated uh, at, at this point. Um, the um, the, um, the the there is an evidence from Orosius. Um, uh, excuse me, uh, from Orosius' tr uh, translation by Alfred the Great that. Um, um, that um, that is um, that has a reference to the uh, land of the Swans that would be the Swedes in relation <coughs> that is named uh, Burgenda land. So uh, this might be a, a further evidence of the Burgundian uh, sc um, Scandinavian origin. Um, <coughs> then uh, even the, there are later medieval sources that actually uh, tell us that the Burgundians had definitely an attachment to the to their Scandinavian origin. This is something actually you find in many other mm, Germanic populations in the migration here. Let's say that um <coughs> uh, even before the language, probably one of the only thing things that th these guys had, in th these Germanic, so-called Germanic populations had in common is that they remembered, even a century afterwards, that they had come from Scandinavia. And some of them even came back to those lands where if they had failed, for instance, it happened, you know, obviously the bigger, more powerful guys seized the, the wealthy Roman lands um, <coughs> of, s of Western and Southern Europe. Um, and those who didn't make it, or other, they were crushed during the the, the various com the, the competition and various wars that occurred there. Um, came back to to the north, and, um, and this was actually common practice. We ha have evidence also a lot of Germanic auxiliars that were born, say, in, I don't know, Denmark, today's Denmark. They went fi um, fighting into the Roman army. Uh, <coughs> for all their service, and then when they were were done, they came back to Denmark and proudly remembering the fact that they had been Roman soldiers. So, um, <coughs> uh, this idea that mm, you know this even distances were not really big at the time. We have this idea also for the Middle Ages that ah traveling was the was this terribly difficult thing, oh, communications were super... it's completely false under any historical... Uh, by any historical standards, people have always moved. I mean, human mobility is probably the most underestimated um, uh, thing in history, to tell you the truth. Um, <coughs> and we know that by extensive evidence that that uh, that, that world w wasn't that, that, that far. I mean, it was it, it was probably more far culturally speaking than actually um, in 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 space. So, but aside from this, uh, we have um, evidence that um, uh, the um, by Pliny that um, um, there were um, 
um, excuse me, we have a um, around the second century AD. Actually, the, the, there is a um, well, the the actually the later I think uh, because I'm reflecting about which, which is the first evidence that actually the Burgundians came from the place in Central Europe we think they came from that should be Ger uh, as late as Jordanus. Um, <coughs> that during the third century AD states that the Burgundians uh, um, lived um, in the Vistula Basin. So that is modern day Poland. And since the Burgundians, and we know, because this is all about crossing uh, sources, we know that they dwelled more or less among the uh, so called Eastern Germanic tribes. Um, so we're talking um, about the Rugi, the Goths, the Japide, um, Japide uh, the Vandals, uh <coughs> etc. So this relative late evidence of the Burgundians dwelling in the Vistula River makes us believe that there were mm, among this, these populations that, by the way, had mm, began to, to, to move around the 2nd century AD. You know, that 2nd century AD is the moment of, say, of crisis of the Germanic system. That's where they, they began to put themselves in motion, while up to that point, basically, the Romans had contained them, had contained them into Germany. And uh, it, it wasn't really about their push. I mean, the, the were, we, it's really complicated even here to explain why the, the migration was set in motion. Um, <coughs> this had actually not much to do with what the relations with the Romans were. I mean, the, the, the obviously the, the whole thing was deeply intertwined in terms of consequences, but um, there were certain movements that um, probably were dictated by environmental factors and stuff like that. Um, <coughs> so we kn we know that the the Burgundians joined into the um, in the in this tumultuous phase into the raids against the Roman Empire, but often as um, really as, as associated to other Germanic populations. Mm. Um, think of take the Marcomannic Wars, where in, in the sense in the Eastern sect sector, I mean on the Danubian frontier, um, we find lots of like the, the Longobards, the Vandals that uh, mm, that even though would have um, popped up, uh, popped up a more, mm, a more um, let's say more, um, let's say, uh, more gushingly, say, impetuously, much later, actually, we're we're already there, and we're joining to uh, these mm, greater uh, confederations at the time that they still weren't in turn. Um, <coughs> Jordanus uh, um, actually also states that by this time the uh, Burgundians were almost annihilated by the uh, Japans um, under their king Fastida, uh, um, and uh, in fact we we don't. So kind of um, we we don't have evidence of the Burgundians for for some mm, decades to to come. Um, this is actually pretty common. I mean, the, as we were saying, these populations clashed continuously one against the other, and um, and even in demographical terms, a battle could wipe out mm, I don't know one generation of male adults, and uh, and that was a very serious concern in the migration era because these populations lived in, in an environment that didn't support uh, agriculture, if not mm, in a secondary, for secondary, um, uh, uh, let's say, in, in a non-satisfactory way in terms of uh, uh, of um, of um, the people's. Um, living resources and and fighting was very often the only uh, the only way to seize that few that um, could support uh, survival um, so being defeated was a very serious matter many populations at this time that got defeated uh, were uh, uh, either they disappeared because sometimes and there were certain peoples were practically wiped out but most of the times were integrated into other populations and they ended up to lose their uh, ethnonym. I mean, oh, surely the populations whose name we know today are only a, a, a small part 
of all the ones that existed at, at the time and that uh, have uh, have not made it to, to, to be remembered in history simply because they have disappeared in a way or in another. Um, some of these populations might have survived as clans within the broader t and tribal and confederational systems, but um, they didn't make it, uh, make it as peoples on their own. Uh, I now right now I don't know much about the Japits in general, but in, uh, the Japits weren't, however, also in later times this very big, powerful uh, people. So my my idea is that this, the Burgundians probably at this time weren't that that strong. Recently, I made a video about the Vandals, and I must say that probably these were kind of aggregated populations to greater blocks, like the, the really strong ones, or at least that made it later, especially in the Ukrainian steppes, were, were the Goths that rose to be some of the most powerful Germanic confederations of the time. These Eastern Ger Germanic tribes, although they had some future, they, they have sort of, you know, they're not so compact, like the Germans of the Elbe or the one of the West. I don't know why I got this impression, it might be wrong. But let's say that even being defeated um, more than once by a certain population definitely uh, sensibly weakened the power of this uh, <coughs> of this uh, populations. Um, at this time, in fact, um, what w we find the Burgundians again um, in the late third century. Uh, aggregated to, to other populations, um, launching um, raids into Roman Gaul, and um, we suspect that these weren't the wall the wall people. Like probably part of the Go uh, of the Burgundians was was still there in the east. This was also normal. That were multiple, mm, let's say, um <coughs> um, multiple. Um, um, blocks of the same people that uh, um, had split out uh, for, for, for some reason or maybe joined uh, other population in other raids for eventually coming back to the originary block of the people. We've seen it with the Vandals as well, they probably had when they, they migrated into the 5th century into Roman Gaul, they, 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 there was a Danubian part of them and, and a um, say a more mm, mm, a northeastern part, let's say, in, in and this was probably similar w for the Burgundians that were also dwelling at the time around this Danubian area, and that, however, were pushing sometimes um, even in, in in the west in in Gaul. Um, part of the reason is that Roman Gaul was definitely wealthier, much wealthier than w what Roman Pannonia was, or at the time Pannonia wasn't that. A very highly in intensely Romanized place. It was a highly militarized place where very important uh, fortresses like Carnuntum, Vindobona, and uh, Quincum. But uh, the population and, and the local economy were weren't uh, that rich. Gold was uh, extremely rich. Uh, even I mean, that's the reason why <laughs> why the Romans invaded. By the way, um, uh, in back in the day, um, in in fact, in this occasion, in Roman gold, the uh, van um, the Burgundians were attached, uh, were led seemingly even by a Vandal king. So the Vandals weren't this huge power even uh, either at the time. So the fact that this part of the Burgundians was under Vandal king tells us that probably <laughs> they weren't ex that extremely powerful as well. Even if when we say under a king, we we it would be proper to say that they joined that king because uh, political certification at this time was very few, especially in that environment, which was extremely fluid from a political point of view. Um, uh, Claudius Mamertinus, uh, a few la uh, few years later, actually uh, remembers the uh, the Burgundians together with the uh, the Alamanni that were also dwelling into that area. The, the, the Alamanni were actually Elb um, Germans. Um, and they had mi began to migrate into the southeast of today's Germany. Uh, at that point, were mm, start to harass the the, the, the Romans exactly in the, from in, the, in those years, in the, from the Agri Decumatus on the eastern side of the Rhine. 
Um, so the um, and and uh, the same source actually uh, states that the Goths had defu and de uh, defeated the Burgundians um, at one point um, previously. So that is in terms of um, strength uh, thermometer probably for the Burgundians not very uh, not a great um, not a great information in the sense that uh, being defeated both by the, the Goths and uh, the uh, the, Jap the Japids and um, being under the Vandal or the Alamanni they weren't um, uh, I mean you you can't understand how partly subservient they were probably to other to other peoples and how they um, they weren't this uh, enormous power. This is a bit the light motif of my of my video today. <laughs> I don't consider the Burgundians to have been this very powerful um, Germanic people at the time. Um, and w another evidence of this is that uh, at a certain point in the uh, late fourth century, under the um, the Empire of Valentinian the First. The Burgundians uh, asked uh, Valentinian I for help against the Alamanni. Mm -hmm. So also here, um, even asking help uh, to the Romans to 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 stop the Alamanni uh, harassing them. So mm, definitely, um, th there is a certain characteristics of these Burgundians th that uh, is being shaped by these by these sources. Um, the um, the Burgundians appear at begin uh, once again in, in, into our raid uh, historical radar at the beginning of the fifth century. Um, 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 substantially, they crossed into uh, into uh, the uh, together with the other uh, with the Alans, the Vandals, uh, the Suevi, etc. Uh, into uh, into Roman Gaul. I mean, the great ad, uh, advance of, of four on, uh, 406 that was uh, partly triggered by the fact that the Visigoths. Um, uh, I mean, that uh, excuse that the uh, yeah that the Visigoths were keeping the Romans busy, and uh, basically the Romans had uh, taken out a lot of of military presence from Gaul. So these um, populations that were dwelling into the Danubian area um, decided to cross en masse into Gaul. Um, there was some uh, resistance uh, put up by the Franks there this time were uh, Roman uh, federati of the empire, also partly by the Alamanni um, on the Rhine frontier, but the 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 seed, uh, the, seed uh, the human tide, let's say, passed into, into Gaul and the Burgundians were among them. Um, the uh, the majority of these these Danubian peoples eventually uh, moved into into um, Spain, into Roman Spain. Um, uh, I talk extensively about this in the video I made about the Vandals. So if you want to listen to that, maybe it can help you. Um, um, uh, some others were settled into Gaul, part of the islands, etc. Um, while the Burgundians kind of lost the race, or at least maybe they didn't have the um, the, the the force to compete with the others, um, and they remained actually in a sort of um, uh, in a sort of uh, frontier area between the. Uh, uh, in, in the Roman province of the so-called uh, uh, Germania Secunda or Germania Se Secunda, that is essentially the um, Germania Inferior, the northern uh, uh, Ro uh, Roman northern Germany, let's say, um, uh, along the Middle Rhine. So a very central position that, um, as I was saying before, probably tells us that Burgundians couldn't really um, win uh, even hope to win the race with 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 other uh, with with the other populations that are across the Rhine in settling in finding a space uh, at least as an autonomous people into into Gaul or into Spain. So the Burgundians remained uh, sort sus uh, sort of suspended into this frontier area between the Franks and the Alamanni and uh, forming their what is 
usually called the, the first Burgundian kingdom into uh, into um, uh, in, into uh, into Germany. This is uh, into the, uh, let's say across um, between Gaul and Germany. This is very important from a strategical point of view because I think that the, mm, the Burgundians um, at this time were trying to maintain an equilibrium. Being aware of their relative weakness, they were mm, mm, kind of um, scoping in the area to find the best um, location not to be uh, too hardly pressed by certain peoples and especially more than else probably trying to find someone who could help them in turn. The Middle Rhine was a very good place for doing this because I it was halfway between the Roman Gallic uh, world and the uh, Germanic Hunnic one at this point because the Huns had actually pushed all these populations toward the west. And there is extensive evidence I believe of um, Hunnic influence into Burgundian culture that we will call uh, we will recall later and in fact we have evidence that the burgundians there was a, a, a contingent of burgundians fighting in attila's hunnic army at the battle of the caudalanian fields um, and the Burgundians in this sense were a bit sneaky, I mean from one side were a bit uh, for the romans for the, uh, one side for the huns and they uh, tried to to save their own skin by um, playing it um, um, playing this political equilibrium in, into that area of Central Europe. Um, so um, the um, in 411, and this is interesting because this 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 specific event I'm gonna tell now is tells us uh, much how the Burgundians were actually skilled at playing <laughs> with the situation. Basically, uh, the Burgundian king Gundahar. Um, or Gundikar, as you want to call it, and um, um, and uh, the king of the islands, uh, Gore, uh, created a puppet emperor in Gaul n named Jovinus, and with the authority deriving from this Gallic emperor uh, that they controlled, um, uh, the Burgundians um, settled officially on the left, that is the, the Gallic Roman Gallic bank of the Rhine, between the rivers Lauter and uh, Nye, see, uh, seizing um, um, relatively important centers of the time that were uh, today's Worms, Speyer, and uh, uh, Strasbourg. And um, Strasbourg, uh, if you want to tell it the French way. And uh, they, um, this was um, kind of, um, you know, it was normal in late Roman times to have this mm, very weird uh, figures of um, of uh, rebel emperors, especially in Gaul, where there were lots of resources to support a sort of uh, parallel empire to uh, to the one of, of the West, and um, and for uh, Roman generals to 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 rise um, and to to proclaim themselves emperors. So this uh, initiative of creating um, and the popular emperor at Jovinus wasn't probably void, it wasn't purely, let's say, anecdotal, it wasn't purely uh, for, um, let's say, uh, mm, uh, it, it didn't pass really a notice, because we know that the emperor Honorius um, granted through the so-called hospitalitas m uh, system the um, the, um, the land that the Burgundians had seized um um uh with the let's say the most important center of uh Worms. at the time it was called Borberto Magus this w these were originally celtic roman settlements and Borberto Magus is a typical celtic um sounding name um and um it wasn't definitely you know uh, now I, I don't want to get into the details why Honoris did this but it, it, it's 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 pretty much evident that at that time the, the West uh, hadn't uh, that great resistance to these um, to these populations, especially in Gaul, um, uh, because there were problems even in Italy, but Gaul in this sense was kind of lost, and 
Uh, there was, however, a um, still strong interaction between the, the Western Roman Empire and, uh, and these Germanic populations, for which, theoretically, the Western Romans um, might have r claimed back those lands one day. And these Germanic populations, uh, having settled there, mm, mm, had some benefits um, deriving from mm, mm, having a dialogue with, with the Romans and having as in this case, uh, their um, their prerogatives um, form um, say that their possessions uh, formalized by the the actual uh, Roman public authority that, uh, in the sense, they were seeking for to to back their own to back their own prerogatives. Um, so it was a way to obviously also for the Romans to to play uh, a bit. Um, uh, hoping that these populations would would turn one against the other and and didn't mm, advance further into into Roman uh, lands, um, the Middle Rhine wasn't at all a very uh, rich area, telling the truth. I mean, uh, infrastructurally speaking, the, the those mm, places had been steadily declining. Um, the 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 Franks and the Alamanni that had settled there partly. Uh, also, basically occupied the populated, um, the populated areas. Uh, some of them, w which w w had been otherwise relatively mm, strongly Romanized, at least for that mm, part of the empire's standards. Um, but I mean, th there wasn't much t to be lost for the Romans. On the contrary, uh, especially having uh, these people settled on the uh, Rhine frontier could be uh, useful, especially in that moment which the, the into which the Huns had to come. So it was essentially, I mean, the, the, the Germanic populations settled in Gaul were meant to, 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 to stem the Hunnic advance in some form. Um, the, um, so the Burgundians at this point were federati, settled with the hospitalitas system. Uh, I believe so that the lands were um, the land property had been uh, divided into you know and and, and dis distributed among the um, the Burgundian and freemen. Um, the um, but Burgundians, as we were saying, were actually pretty uh, pretty desperate in ba uh, uh, um, into making some some progress and. Uh, um, and their kind of uh, double mm, double side policy poli um, policy was it's kind of witnessed by the fact that in spite of this they kept launching raids into um, into Roman uh, uh, Gallia uh, Belgica or, or Belgica. Um, so um, the uh, the Romans uh, got got fed up with with this, and they decided to uh, to punish them, and that's where the Burgundians suffer very very heavy blow that puts an end to their so-called first uh, kingdom uh, in 436, and this is a very important. Um, uh, episode actually for the um, consequences that it would have in the history of European literature, um, because this is actually where the history of the Nibelungen lead actually takes place. What happened in 436 is that the Roman general Etius or uh, Etius, um, um, s um, using Han uh, mercenaries that definitely exist. I mean the Huns. Um, I mean, the Attila was still out there, but there were Huns who would mm, be hired as mercenaries in, into the Roman army, uh, even if uh, the Romans were, were at war with, with Attila. And, um, and the Hunnic mercenaries of Etius basically uh, destroyed the um, Burgundian Rhineland uh, kingdom f uh, the in the following uh, year. Um, and uh, the, uh, this allegedly brought also to the, um, the death of Gundahar, the Burgundian king Gundahar in fight, uh, along with the majority of the Burgundian tribe. So it was a very, um, a very, um, very heavy blow for this population. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the destruction of Worms is uh, recalled, in fact, also in the heroic legend of the, the Nibelungen lead, 
um, Gun the, the Burgundian King Gundahar would be uh, Gunther, mm -hmm. and um, and um, here um, her wife uh, Brunhild and all, um, and um, so um, the. Um, um, and the, 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 the wha what is interesting in the Nibelung lead is the space given to even the Huns because in the uh, in the Nibelung lead, it's actually um, Etzel that would be Hatila the Han himself that destroys um, uh, that destroys the uh, the Burgundians and kills them like all the king and all the twenty thousand Burgundians. Um, so this is very dramatic um, 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 uh, song that is typical of Germanic epics where the heroes get mm, killed, uh, etc. Think about uh, Siegfried and uh, in the same story. So, um, mm, but uh, even the, the Burgundians or the other Germanic populations that told the story obviously embellished it a little by obviously not throwing the, not mentioning the fact that they had been destroyed by uh, s certain Roman auxiliaries, but none of Attila uh, himself. It's kind of more. Uh, <laughs> is kind of more honorable, given the dramatic tone of the of, of the uh, lead. Um, um, but uh, it's it's fascinating because in the Nibelungen lead, actually, there is some evidence also of. Um, I mean, what is supposedly um, uh, the uh, evidence of uh, even of Etius in 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 some fashion. Uh, um, I don't know whether if uh, Etzel in this sense can be associated not just to Attila but etymologically speaking to Etzius himself. Um, but even through Drizzly's echo and, um, and and these sources are very fascinating. I mean, in the same period, uh, even the Arthurian cycle was uh, being created there in Britain. So um, it's very fascinating that actually much of the um, chivalric uh, um, um, the, the, the themes of chivalric literature b um, I had in the Middle Ages actually had the ro roots into this migration era uh, events. Um, at this point, the Burgundians were um, were at the mercy of the Romans, uh, essentially, and uh, the um, and and at, at this point, we don't really uh, the sources do not really state why this happened. But the Burgundians were once defeated, were um, remained allies of uh, formerly Federati of the Romans, that is, allies of the Romans. And were resettled in 443 by Etius in the region of um, uh, Sapaudia, from which the modern name of Savoy takes names, takes its name. Albeit, uh, it's not really geographically the, um, the same, uh, the same area. Um, Sapaudia means uh, Sapaudia in Latin actually means uh, the uh, lands of of um, of pine, of the pine tree. Um, uh, so um, the um, it, it corresponds just partly to modern day Savoy. Actually, stretches also to to other lands. Um, and uh, the mm, why did the Romans did as well? The idea is that the uh, th they had to guard the Alpine passes, uh, the, the northwestern Alpine passes for the Romans. So this um, is very. Um, I think these are all other hints to tell us how the Burgundians overall were probably a weak people by the the standards of the migration era. Because first of all, they got wiped out by the um, by the Hunnic um, auxiliaries of the Romans. All the pre previous hints that we have named were there. Then they are resettled by the Romans. So probably at this point, the Romans didn't consider them as a threat, and they settled them into an area that is, is very heavily mountainous. Um, so that's not something you want to do as a Roman if you fear this population, because at that point, that population could um, take uh, advantage of the situation and start to to create problems also for. Um, for the Romans themselves, because the Romans had to cross from Italy into into Gaul at this point quite uh, quite often, 
and you wouldn't put at um, uh, at guarding the alpine passes you have to cross a population who can turn um, hostile from um, uh, or that has a particular strength that can be eventually turned up against you. So this tells us prob probably that at this point the Burgundians were reduced to the uh, to to the bone um, and in terms of uh, you know even of ethnical cohesion um, and that were mm, so nauseous or at least uh, so um, desperate about survival that they they could they could be very obe obedient federati for the Romans into this Alpine area. Um, the um, actually uh, this re uh, the the region of Sapaudia encompassed very um, very important uh, cities that had been previously part of Roman Gaul. Um, the probably the greater uh, Burgundian demographic concentration was um, was around the uh, city of Lugdunum, today um, Lyon in France, um, that had been actually the, Lug the Gallia Lugdunensis uh, was, uh, you know, Lugdun ha had been so important to be at the head of a province back in the day. Um, and, uh, and generally speaking, or yet, uh, still at that time, th these regions of southern Gaul were sensibly wealthier than one of the north, they were still functioning cities and were pretty intensely, um, there were areas of the in intense and old uh, and ancient romanization so um, it's meaningful that the Burgundians were settled in, in there, I believe, in, s in terms of strategic balance. Um, the, um, after uh, the, um, the death of Gundahar in, in battle, um, the um, um, seems to have uh, become a king of the Burgundians uh, after um, uh, afterwards. Uh, Gundiok was um, Gundahar's son, by the way, but we don't have to think at this point of the Burgundians as a sort of unitary kingdom at all. Um, these were actually a cluster of clans that uh, probably had this uh, dynastic um, lineage that have eventually in, in perfectly according in accordance with uh, Germanic tradition used to split up the, the domains, uh, the Burgundian domains at, at each generation among the various um, sons. This was a common practice of the Germanic um, kingdoms and it was actually cause of great of great uh, problems from a, from a political point of view because all these um, uh, brothers felt that they were entitled to be, you know, the, the um, uh, that first of all they could, uh, there wasn't really a single successor so the this uh, translated into, equated to uh, a great competition between all these various brothers that turned it against each other, I mean, um, and, and, and um, in various areas uh, creating various areas of influence, take the Merovingian Empire, was something so big because Clovis had managed to take out of all the the other Frankish nobility, but still, basically, it collapsed because the, the got split among the various um, the various successors, and uh, basically, at the end of the seventh centuries, was there wasn't a, a kingdom. Uh, there was not. First of all, there was <laughs> no thing like a Frankish Empire but not even a Frankish kingdom, because as a matter of fact there were four distinct kingdoms in de facto that were always clashing one against the other. Um, this was actually, not even the Carolingians um, uh, were able to uh, overcome the um, this Germanic tradition, uh, and that's the reason why the Carolingian Empire fell, practically. Um, because they split up continuously uh, the, 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 the territories. And especially at this time, this, this, uh, you have to think that these Germans had essentially come out from a generation or two out of the forest, literally, and um, into a, a world, a Roman world, was completely different from what they had been used to. So the greatest novelty for them was this, the permanent settlement with land possession, with very base land possessions. So this actually, uh, you know, the idea of splitting um, 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 the uh, the heritage uh, in the uh, in Central Europe or in the steppe was kind of normal because the heritage was um, essentially um, mobile goods. So as long as the people migrated 
uh, it was a, uh, an equal repartition of the uh, of the father's uh, inheritance, not heritage, but inheritance. Sorry, and um, and that was good. Uh, the the problems ar arose when uh, when obviously these um, goods uh, pass from uh, mobile to 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 fix, uh, and because that was mainly land, and land is not something you can uh, adjust. Let's say bringing it with you and not causing problems. That means that it's first of all a base for creating a permanent domain and that obviously created a uh, crisis for the unity of of the um of the kingdom uh, unless one of the brothers died and <laughs> what a best way was to, to for for killing uh, w w uh, it, it was for such an evenience to happen but for killing him and this entailed wars and clashes and, all, and a lot of competition the romans could also play on because essentially it wasn't a unitary kingdom but lots of various clans that could be uh, kind of influenced and controlled um, in a certain way um, which I which was not always a um, a great um, a great thing it really varied sometimes the Romans needed especially in the most turbulent areas um, s these populations to have actually one single uh, leader one single ruling dynasty um, other times they preferred to split them up. It really depended on the situation. Um, in the case of Burgundy, uh, the whole thing was helped by the division was helped by the fact that um, th the territory is quite complex. I mean, it's a lot of ballets, um, um, a lot of mountains. So the 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 physical boundaries are actually pretty 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 evident. It's not like a flatland can be easily reached and occupied. Um, so this contributed to the fragmentation of of, of the kingdom. Um, the um, the the interesting thing about um, this um, of of Gundahar's son uh, Gundiok is his name. Um, this is something I learned when I was studying the Longobards because there was actually a Longobard king who called himself uh, Gundiok as uh, as well. So the um, aside from the um, the root Gund, uh, that is kind of um, uh, it's kind of ger it's Germanic, but w what is important here is the descendants uh, Yok or Yuk. Does it remember something to you? Well, yes, it is. It should at least. <laughs> um, it is the suffix that you find in um, the um, world of the s um, uh, let's say in the uh, Turkic world world of the steppe. Um, it's the same uh, suffix for names like the Seljuks or the Mamluks, you know, all these yuks, yuks, yuks that recurs into populations like the ones of the Huns at that time. And, and this name um, is very important when for, for scholars when they study the, um, uh, the cultural influences of the Huns on the Germanic elites at the time. Uh, the Burgundians, as we have seen, were part of the guys who fled the Huns, who managed to settle into Gaul. At this time, the rest of the Germanic world was under the Huns, and there is pretty extensive evidence, as it was in the case of the Longobards, for the, the king also named Gundiok, that uh, um, the, um, this uh, suffix yuk, coming from the steppes, uh, the, uh, the, the Hunnic steppes, was actually added to the um, to the name of the uh, of the so uh, of, the, uh, of the sovereign, wi which usually was a nickname, by the way. I, these weren't really their full names, um, or their real names either. Um, but it, it was taken as a political slogan to kind of appease the uh, the Huns, the Hunnic rulers. That is so true in the case of the Longobards, who seemingly were the, the last Germanic people to act actually abandon the Huns, even later, under up to the uh, end of the of uh, Attila's son reign, actually. So a very um, a lengthy time, which also explains uh, partly the um, the equestrian traditions of the Longobards and why they had this kind of um, zootechnical uh, knowledge. Uh, that is uh, revealed by the the sources. In the case of the Bung, uh, of the Burgundians, it's I think all the more interesting because um, um, it's as if um, they're in the in in the Middle Rhine before getting wiped out by the Hunnic uh, Roman auxiliars. 
um, they had kind of um, a r been influenced by the Hunnic, uh, the Hunnic uh, power, and the fact that a guy like a king uh, or a king's son at the time was called with a Hunnic sounding name like Gundiok tells us that probably the, the Burgundians were uh, sowing very um, strong ties with the Huns, at least more than what is mm, uh, apparently believed. And this would explain also partly why the Romans wiped them away, because uh, this meant that they were a, uh, an extraneous body into this uh, r Rhine frontier that for the Romans had to be all about stemming the Huns, not uh, siding with them. So I think there are many hints that, if put together, really depict um, a very dual nature of the Burgundian um, of, of the Burgundian political intentions at the time, um, and uh, the uh, and and that as a consequence, they um, uh, showing that they. Um, they, they they were affected by uh, Hanic culture and um, they probably looked favorably at it. In the same Nibelungen lead, um, I mean, um, the Huns are not seen as the 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 uh, complete evil guys of the situation. I mean, uh, Attila is seen as a great great king, and and this actually reflects what the Germans actually thought of this king. Also, because he had come in Germany and had uh, subdued everyone, so <laughs> he achieved something that no German could could no German tribe could have done in that context. And and the Germans definitely respected this. Um, this um, prowess, even though uh, they had been victim uh, of of the Hunnic domination, so um, the, the Germans appreciated those who were uh, good at uh, at at arms. Uh, and Attila's um, uh, the admiration towards Attila is definitely a proof of it. So the Burgundians um, at this point were uh, were destroyed, I think, and, and resettled into Sapaudia by the Romans. Uh, to to really also take him away as uh, as a sort of uh, um, crypto um, Hanic uh, allies, and from this point onwards, they essentially uh, become Romans' um, good allies. Let's say that um, in Sapaudia, the Burgundians um, participated to the, in the Roman politics, as we will in, in political and military. Um, uh, vicissitudes, and they also got pretty quickly Romanized in there. Um, the um, the the um, uh, Gundiok um, also um, um, seemingly ruled the areas. Uh, well, excuse me. I, I have to check this. Uh, this uh, this guy because I don't remember something. Oh yes. So uh, Gundiok is also uh, called Gonderic because um, this tells you also in here the, the dual nature of this uh, identity. So he, 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 he this these nicknames could could vary also accordingly to the. Um, to the ethnicity that they were referred to, I mean, to the population they were referred to. Obviously, for to the to the Germans, he it, he was probably Gondrik For uh, to the Huns, Gondiok uh, sounded better. Now, what we know about Gundiok, uh, remembering what we were telling you for, that is that he he was king of the Burgundians, but he didn't rule literally de facto over the whole Burgundian lands. It was seemingly. Um, 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 ruling on the areas of the Saon, the Dauphiné, Sa uh, Savoy, and parts of uh, and a part of Provence. Provence. Um, he um, he set up actually the capital of the uh, Kingdom of Burgundy into Vienne. That was also probably after Lugdunum, the most important Roman uh, Roman city uh, in in there. Um, and had had probably risen to to a greater importance than looked at them actually with with time. Um, um, uh, another very important city was Arles, but uh, Arelate in in Latin. But 
um, this was still held by, by the Romans. So the Burgundians ruled this poorer interland, while the, the actually the richer Roman uh, cities were on the um, on the uh, on the coast of, of the Mediterranean of Provence, um, but still pretty close. Which tells you, by the way, how even in Gaul, uh, there there was this continuity in the. Uh, Hellenization and Romanization of the coastal areas and why the immediate interland was, was a, a much more different thing so that the Burgundian domains could arrive up to actually um, very close to, to coastal areas but still belonging to, to a wholly different world from um, now this, this was just a consideration that I but um, it's also important to, to, to see that I mean uh, the 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 economical geography also of of the um, Roman Empire is important to actually understand why certain peoples were settled uh, in a certain place. Now, with um, uh, uh, the um, at, at this point, as was saying, the, the Burgundians were faithful allies of the Romans. So even Cle having been um, <laughs> having uh, suffered such a heavy defeat, had uh, told them who was still the ruler in there, um, and uh, and also because they were probably weaker than the average, as we have said. And they fought. Uh, uh, I mean, as a wall, uh, uh, as a Burgundian people together uh, with the uh, Visigoths and um, other Roman allies of the Battle of the Catalanian Fields in 451. And we have said that probably there were also certain Burgundians in, in Attila's army that had remained probably in the middle of Rhine at a point or had fled into the Hunnic uh, dominated lands. So that uh, reveals once again the attachment the parts of the Burgundians uh, part of the Burgundians had had to to the Huns. Um, it's kind of easy to read, I think. I don't know what maybe uh, I'm wrong, but uh, all these hints are seem to me so 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 ex so evident in in, in many ways um, of what the the Burgundians had done in terms of pol international politics up, up to that time. And uh, the um, and at this time the Burgundians seems to have actually had a, a strong a, rel um, a very a strong relation a strong bond vi with the Visigoths and the Visigoths were their um, next door neighbors actually because they were still settled in um, in southwestern Gaul so their uh, Aquitanian the Visigothic Aquitanian uh, lands bordered with one of the Burgundians in the uh, Viennois, the, the, the Pro Provence area, um, um, and uh, and part of the Burgundians actually uh, joined Visigoths in um, uh, Theodoric's uh, uh, the second um, expeditions against uh, the uh, the Swabians in 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 the Iberian Peninsula in 455. Um, so mm, this was normal business, I mean, to send troops to your ally and uh, to participate, um, to share the, the benefits in, in some way. There were uh, certain also matrimonial ties, I, I believe. I'm not aware at this moment. I haven't checked out, but I mean, there was this Burgundian Visigothic axis that kind of worked. Uh, also, because at this point, actually, um, especially with the end of Attila, um, and the Franks began to to expand rather uh, into uh, into into Gaul, and the major um, I, I mean the, the the southern block formed by the Visigoths and Burgundians was kind of uh, in opposition to to the Frankish expansionism, as we will see, which included also the uh, uh, the Alamanni uh, as well. So, um, uh, relatively to this, um, the Burgundians also uh, had some influence on the Italian affairs uh, because it seems that the murder of the uh, Western Roman Emperor Petronius Maximus uh, just before the, uh, the Vandalic sack of Rome had seemingly been um, um, 
carried out by uh, some Burgundian intervention. Um, usually uh, it's Rissimer who is um, blamed for uh, the event and um and, and there are in this sense uh, also in here the, the 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 circle can be closed because uh, we know of relations between uh Rissimer and the Burgundians as um uh, probably Gundiok's brother-in-law in law was uh, Gunduba, um Gundubad's uh, uncle i mean sorry uh, i mean Rissimer uh w was probably Gunduok's brother-in-law and Gundubad's uncle. So they were definitely sir. It was normal for these figures uh, to um, uh, to become, um, you know, as I was saying, also to to, inter to to intertwine matrimonial ties with with foreign uh, uh, resources. I mean, um, Flavius uh, Rissimer was a Romanized Germanic general. He actually was half. Um, half uh, Swabian and half Vis Visigothic and um, he um, he basically r was ruling, uh, uh, he eventually would rule uh, uh, on, on the Western Roman Empire in practice of what remained of it between 461 and 472 so we are, we are really in the last uh, moments of, of, of the Western Roman Empire uh, moments of life of the Western Roman Empire he was magis magis Magister Militum of the empire and uh, he he had set up certain puppet emperors and he was dealing evenly with the uh, with the Burgundians that were just northwest of Italy and were evenly important um, for uh, with international relations for for Rissimer. Um, the um, um, the um, uh, while the uh, the the Western Empire was declining. The Burgundians probably began also to acquire um, a certain, um, uh, let's say, a larger um, mm, territorial mm, power into Burgundy um, proper, and um, mostly negotiating that with local uh, elites, mm, with w with mm, which they were also mixing. Um, this was kind of natural because um, as weak as the Burgundians might have been, um, they were still settled in, in, in relatively rich uh, areas of, of Europe. So um, since they, they were the ones who, who bore arms locally, um, they could seize uh, uh, whatever they liked, uh, or at least they could negotiate their and their um, their powers structuration with the local sena senators, and um, also to 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 act uh, together because at that point, if you were a, lo a local Roman senator and the Burgundians were ruling uh, uh, in the area, and um, th th there were actually uh, many options for you to eventually marry, I don't know, with one of the um uh daughters of the local uh burgundian uh chieftain um into to actually join the the fates of these uh, civilizations the the process of romanization passed through the elites mostly mm, the burgundian kingdom was uh eventually turned out to be a substantially a quite um quite well integrated kingdom in terms of Roman, Gallic and Germanic um, um, ethnicities um, and the prestige of the local senatorial elites actually remained quite high in, in, in Burgundy. Um, there were also certain in um, uh, Burgundy had an advantage that it was a mountainous area. So even if uh, eventually, as we will see, the, the the Franks managed to incorporate the Burgundian kingdom in, in t into their empire, um, the Burgundians, as other mm, the Burgundian elites at least, remained always kind of um, cohesive as Burgu uh, uh, thinking their Burgundian. Um, um, 
common Burgundian interest. Uh, doesn't matter whether they, uh, you know, th th and, and which was a pretty Romanized one as well. And f for instance, it seems that the Habsburg dynasty later came from a uh, an ancient, um, uh, very ancient dynasty that had its roots into the Burgundian uh, nobility. The uh, very also imp uh, very important. Um, um, Burgundian family of Gallo-Roman origin. So this tells you how this, um, even the, the Roman presence uh, lived on actually into the Germanic kingdoms quite intensely, and especially in, in areas like the ones of Burgundy and of Visigothic Spain, uh, uh, that definitely were the area, the, the the areas where uh, the Roman world was mostly preserved uh, compared to other areas of Europe, at least of, of Latin Germanic Europe. Um, and uh, But Gaul in general was a, a place where the, the Roman legacy actually lived mm, pretty intensely on, uh, even more than, than in, in Italy, mm, because in Italy the Longobards kind of changed a lot, the, the situation. It, it was just in the Byzantine territories that the Roman legacy lived on, but Gaul was actually pretty uh, strongly Romanized. Um, uh, area in the early Middle Ages, um, um, uh, thanks to these um, extremely um, cultured senatorial elites that basically taught the, the Germans also how to deal with uh, the local administration and all, and remain always prominent um, and uh, carved even these spaces when the the the, the Merovingian Empire became began to decline, so that they basically remained ruling uh, in in the place where when they uh, previously inhabited for since since the Roman times as senatorial families. Um, so in um, um, the, um, the in 457, Ricimer, having ever over uh, after having overthrown the Emperor Avitus, he rose m uh, the Emperor Majorian uh, to the throne. Um, so he, uh, Majorian was actually pretty um, uh, friendly, both to Rissimer and the Burgundians, and um, 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 uh, uh, sorry, uh, I mean all the contrary, Maj Majorian was doing essentially the other <laughs> way around. Uh, he turned to be a problem for Rissimer and the Burgundians, um, because uh, Majorian was actually the um, the last uh, Western Roman emperor that could actually achieve something into um, into into restore uh, the the Western Roman rule at least over southern, especially uh, in Spain, because that was the main thing. He uh, he tried to recover Africa to the Vandals, but he was defeated, and and that's where. Um, wi with destruction or disruption of the Ro Western Roman army, it was understood that basically the Western Roman Empire was done, because those uh, that army had been raised with the last uh, manpower and economical resources of Italy, and at least uh, and it was practically understood that with that defeat, um, there was nothing more to do, uh, and that uh, the uh, the barbarians would take over. Um, which is, however, very important because it, sh it still shows, I mean, uh, he was defeated, uh, the Roman army was defeated at Carthagena against the Vandals, but they might have, uh, 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 and they might have as well won. And was it what is interesting is that Majorian had actually recovered mm, uh, a lot of, um, uh, of, of power not just over the Burgundians uh, that were, uh, as we have said, a, a sort of minor power. They were, they were essentially stripped by part of the lands that they had acquired in, in the earlier, um, in the uh, in the years before. But especially on the Visigoths. I mean, the Vis Visigoths, basic, they were in Spain, were also pretty weak and were uh, at this point, um, or at least they they couldn't withstand uh, the Western Roman advance, and they claimed, okay, we are okay, fine, we surrender. Uh, we 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 come we we come back to be your federati that do with us whatever you like, 
and uh, it was just the Roman defeat against the Vandals that eventually uh, left the Visigoths once again free of, uh, of of worries, at least for a while, because th then the Franks arrived, and the Visigothic kingdom was not this huge power, tell me the truth, even if it ruled over a very large land. I mean, the crisis had struck everywhere. The Visigoths were uh, were also, they had very few demographical resources at the time, so uh, even an army raised from Italy at the very end of the Western Roman Empire could could essentially take their their their, their lands back. Um, so relatively to the Burgundians, um, they, they evidently their power was uh, re uh, resized th at this point. Um, uh, but uh, the um, uh, the uh, the the death of Majorian eventually, wh who, um, who was martyred by Erisimer in 461. Um, I mean, they, they came back essentially to be uh, to to enjoy the autonomy that they had had up to that point. Um, the in um, uh, it seems that that then the Burgundians were involved in uh, in other uh, schemes into Italy. Um, uh, the um, they participated to Rissimer conjuration um, uh, uh, conjurations and uh, and and the same Rissimer actually um, planned to. Um, I mean, it's complicated. I'm reading here. Rissimer, who was by now the son-in-law of the Western Emperor Antanius, was plotting with Gondobad to um, to kill his father-in-law. Gondobad behaved the emperor per apparently personal. Hmm? Then eventually, Rissimer and Olibris died, and um, um, and uh, uh, Gondobad basically uh, participated in raising. Um, the um uh, the western roman emperor glycerius to the throne so we are in a phase into which essentially the the um uh the the imperial rule in in Italy of um uh, was evaporating was um the um as we've said after Majorian essentially there was no way to 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 reestablish the, the the strength of the western roman empire and the Burgundians were simply playing on that. Uh, they were close to northern Italy, where most of the political and military uh, balances of the peninsula actually were were decided. Um, so this kind of even dark history about which we don't know so much because sources are very. Um, sometimes it's we have just one source and we don't understand whether. I mean, we don't care. Wh wh what is important really here is that uh, the Burgundians had some political influence on the Italian affairs at this point because so little uh, uh, to so little was the, the Western Roman Empire reduced from in terms of political influence um, and uh, strength and autonomous strength let's say um, and uh, however the Burgundians eventually lost the, um, the the influence over the Western imperial matters towards towards the very end um the um and um and the same Burgundian kingdom was eventually uh split up at the uh um uh, between Gundobad and his brothers Godisil, Kilperic the second and Gundomar the first. So uh, once again there was a um um a cry uh, let's say um um um, a division of the um, of the Burgundian estates among these brothers, and according to Gregory of Tours, um, when Gundobads uh, came back from from Italy from all these political schemes that had uh, seen him protagonist, it was a very uh, bloody uh, fight for, um, for between uh, among all these um, uh, siblings. Uh, Gregory um, states that Gundobad himself murdered his bride Kilperic and uh, that he drowned his wife and, ex and exiled um, uh, uh, their, uh, their daughters. 
um, and one of them would have been uh, what it was to become actually um, uh, Clovis, uh, Clovis' wife. That is very important because at this time the Burgundians had already, uh, s uh, let's say, uh, say the, the especially among the female members of the Burgundian aristocracy, Christianity was, uh, I mean, Catholicism was was pretty much uh, already spread. So it's, it's sad, generally speaking, that um, that uh, the uh, um, um, uh, I think her name was uh, Clotilde or Clotis, uh, I don't know she she, she was called. Uh, she she married Clovis in um, 493, and th that's why it's been believed that she uh, kind of brought to to Clovis conversion to to Catholicism. Actually, Clo um, the uh, Clovis was uh, uh, at this point a um, still a pagan, uh, remarkably. Um, and uh, that's interesting for the Franks because they basically didn't pass through Arianism. They they s uh, convert uh, like the Burgundians. They they converted straight away to to Catholicism from paganism. Um, uh, however, relatively to Gregory the to uh, Gregory of Tours stories, we we don't really know what things were went in this way. Gregory of Tours likes to write these terrible things even for obviously a an ideological reason um, he had to show partly also the cruelty of these uh, nobilities and all and all these work is are is full essentially with such stories but uh, relatively to chr to chronology it seems that um, not everything is really all right so uh, it's possible that um, uh, such events didn't happen but uh, what is true is that all the uh, Burgundians brothers um, a ro a ro of, of royal blood, let's say, if there was anything like that. But also in here it's complicated. Uh, the, the, mm, let's say monarchy wasn't sanctioned in that way at this time into the Germanic lands. But uh, I'm, lo I'm losing too much time now. How, oh my god. It's not so long as I thought. However, um, the um, there was a lot of infight within the 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 um, the uh, Burgundian aristocracy, and um, and 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 at this point, the Franks began to um, to to intervene into these matters. Um, the um, the um, um, the uh, it seems that uh, around for for under the D when Gundobald and Clovis were at war, Gundobald um, betrayed uh, was betrayed by his brother Go uh, Godegzel, uh, who joined the Franks. Uh, it was a clever move because the Franks were extremely powerful at this time, um, uh, and um, Gundobald army seems to have. Soundly defeated by Godigzel, uh, in and, and Clovis forces at one point. Um, the um, he at a certain point, good about it was seemingly in, in check, but he managed to to re to recover his strengths uh, at Avignon, and he managed to sack Vienne. Um, where uh, the same God of Gisele and his um, sup uh, his uh, followers were uh, were slaughtered for in revenge, and um, so Gundobad at this time um, seems to have m miraculously managed to to m remain the sole king of Burgundy, so to reach once again after these bloody affairs a sort of uh, continuous. Um, um I say unopposed authority over the Burgundian domains, and um, his brother Gundamar at this point was probably dead. Um, and um, even though we don't really know what happened, because the sources are are not explicit about this. Um, now, um, really, Clovis, uh, king of the Franks, could intervene uh, once again into Burgundy, but. Um, there was an agreement between him and Gundobad. Actually, um, Gundobad accepted to become a Frankish um, uh, tributary, uh, tributary 
um, and to, to side with the Franks. This was a, pr a very clever move because the Franks had this huge, huge empire already at that point for, for Germanic standards. Clovis was really one of the greatest leaders o of the time and um, he managed, uh, as we were saying before, to wipe out all the Frankish nobility to establish a sort of the, the, the Merovingian dynasty as the sole uh, ruling dynasty uh, in the Frankish world, he ruled over this extremely fertile area of Gaul that from which it could draw extensive agricultural resources that favored, actually always favored Fra France in, in history for, for, mil for military affairs. And, um, and he was at this point expanding against uh, the, the Alamanni, the Burgundians, etc. The, the main problem with the Burgundians was the nature of their territory, as we've often said. Clovis might have invaded Burgundy, but it was still a very tough ground to fight in. It was also r fairly decentralized from the core of Frankish uh, dominions, of Merovingian dominions. So um, it was a good thing to accept um, uh, Gundobad's uh, submission and to make him join into the uh, Frankish military expeditions. It was a pretty, pretty easy to thing to do. You don't have to think at this point there were many other options, reasonable options. The rule of these uh, Germanic monarchs was pretty, uh, um, just like the one of the Romans at this time, was pretty uh, weak uh, in many ways. I mean, you could be stronger or, or weaker than, than a certain power, but, uh, you know, the basically the... Um, the actual mm, political authority was sanctioned by the deterrence posed by your armed forces. I mean, you if you had resources to launch an invasion, uh, especially in the long range, um, um, it's likely that your neighbors obviously mm, would would behave uh, faithfully towards you, or at least. Uh, if not that, that they would fear you in, in some way and behave accordingly. Um, if, um, you know, th there were a many other ways to, to appoint, I mean, even in terms of local control, of uh, control of faraway lands, you could put there, especially with m a matrimonial policy, marriage policy, a um, uh, maybe a, um, a member of your family, but even in there, uh, he had he would have no other option but to mi but to m mingle, let's say, with local aristocracy and to carry out a politics a policy that was a sort of compromise between, in that case, the Merovingians and the local aristocracies, uh, because there was practically no direct way, no coercive way to control those lands, physically at the time. By the way, this uh, at the beginning of sixth century, uh, the the I mean. Yeah, this was actually the golden age of the Merovingians, b uh, but the um, the economy was already contracting at this time in Europe, in the in Eurasia in general, um, and um, so maybe they, they didn't sense that yet, but a steady decline would have would have would have um, uh, would have happened, uh, would have taken place uh, shortly afterwards, and this eventually contributed to to fragment these uh, political domains that uh, as I was as we've seen in the case of the Merovingian Empire would have led to even to the disruption of the Frankish kingdom into se separate entities um, the um, the problem of the resources here is crucial in terms of agricultural and manpower uh, if you didn't have those you could go literally nowhere um and um the uh, um the the um, Gundabad's Burgundian forces actually seems to have assisted the Franks in their uh victory uh at um uh, I think uh, it was the battle of uh, of Vouillet. um oh yeah uh, against the uh, the Visigoths uh, that basically kicked them out of uh, southern uh, southern Gaul, it was a major um, Frankish uh, achievement because basically they they confined the Visigoths into the Iberian Peninsula and they were the unopposed rulers of of Gauls with the Burgundians and the Alamanni being reduced to to obedience. 
Um, so also in here, the, the participation of Burgundian forces was um, forced by the political um, the political situation. Um, so Gondobad's um, reign is important also for for other uh, for other reasons. Um, the, um, the there were um, certain um, uh, laws, uh, legal codes that were promulgated. Uh, the most important one is the Liber Constitutionum Sive Lex uh, Gundoba, uh, Gundobada, that is essentially the, the book of the constitutions, uh, that is the, um, the Gundobad's law, um, and, uh, which is also known as Lex Burgundiorum, so the, the Lex of the Burgundians, or, si or even just the Lex Gundobada or the Liber by, by um, say, uh, from the Burgundian perspective, that was the the only one <laughs> that mattered, and um, the um, it was actually issued um, uh, between the end uh, of the fifth and the beginning of sixth century. It was a, it wasn't a continue? Uh, it wasn't a. It didn't come out in a in a single part, and. Um, a principle, in fact, was um, um, promulgated by Gundabad, but also partly by his son Sigismund. Um, so this this is essentially a collection of uh, Germanic customary uh, law, uh, the Burgundian one at least. And um, the the interesting fact about this is that it 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 um, it, uh, uh, it borrowed a lot from the uh, Lex Visigotorum, that is instead the um, uh, the Visigothic uh, lo um, law, that is a set of laws promulgated by Kindeswind. Uh, um, uh, I mean, it was eventually, um, um, well, Lex Romana, well, mm, I'm pretty think I'm messing up right now because uh, the Lex Visigothorum, yeah, because the Visigoths had already promulgated this. The um, the the ne I never the usually the the Visigothic and, and, and Burgundian laws are um, um, yeah this is how it is so it's, it's a bit complicated because we don't clearly know exactly to to whom these laws were actually uh, destined to there's all a problem now we don't have to time to to explain it but the Lex Romana Visigothorum is not Lex, Lex Visigothorum. Uh, known al uh, also as the Breviarium uh, Alarishanum. Mm -hmm. And these were uh, laws that had been composed by the Visigoths uh, while they were still in Southern Gaul, by the way, um, by Alaric II in 406, so just a year before uh, the, b the defeat of Bouillet. Um, and, um, and there had already been told the uh, Eurasian Code in, uh, that had promulgated towards the 476, um, it was at least traditionally intended to, mm, it's traditionally intended to have been destined to the mm, Visigothic population, but telling the truth, these codes were not just for the Visigoths, it was actually also for the, uh, for the Roman, especially for the Roman population. In fact, it was a compendium between the Roman, uh, the Theodosian uh, Roman rite, this time Justinian's code still didn't exist, or the Theodosian one, that is actually the one actually uh, Justinian formalized. And um, it was actually meant f also for the Roman population. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, um, the, um, um, s so, um, uh, it was also influential for eventually the uh, the following um, uh, Lex uh, Ripuaria or Ribuaria that was the uh, the um, the the laws of the Ripuarian Franks mm -hmm. uh, that in turn would influence the Lex Saxonum for the Saxons that was created by the Franks for the Saxons in eight hundred uh, uh, in eight hundred and two so. Uh, very complicated. I should make a video about these things because I can't discuss them in such a scanny 
um, disordered way, but let's say that more more than else, the, the Burgundians and the Visigoths. This is what I think it's important to remember. Had promulgated these codes were actually very very close, or the, the resent pretty much of the uh, influences of the uh, Roman uh, law. In fact. Um, in addition to the Lex Gundobad, uh, um, Gundobad also um, created, issued or codified a set of laws that is known as the Lex Romana Burgundiorum, like just the Lex Romana Visigut Visigotorum, that was um, essentially meaning this. From, I mean, these guys were ruling over. Uh, uh, their own Germanic people, but mostly over a larger and, and much more important Roman population in their own lands. The Germanic peoples were, in a few generations, basically mixed up with Roman population. So what was done was exactly this. There was a law for the, um, since uh, there was the personality of, 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 uh, of right, let's say, in the sense that you could um, decide whether you wanted to um, I mean, at the beginning, it was not really a matter of choice. I mean, the idea of that if you were German, you, you uh, this this was the the principle that the idea. If you were German, you you had to be judged by the laws of your Germanic people. If you were Roman, you had to be uh, judged not by Roman law that actually was still in force among the Romans uh, in their autonomy, because this Roman uh, commun population was largely autonomous, and the Germans had no way to 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 prevent for them to, to still living in this this Roman law that was already modified, however, compared to the Theodosian law, because eventually law changes, laws adapts, especially with the collapse of Western Roman Empire, w which was the Roman authority that could uh, could make that law respected. I mean, it was a matter of constitutionary law, even in there. Um, but the idea was that um, these uh, um, leges romane, either Burgundiorum, uh, either Visigotorum, were meant uh, for mm, to be the uh, the point of reference for the Romans of of the uh, Burgundian and Visigothic population uh, for themselves. And what was the need of this? Well, the need was that obviously the, the Visigoths and the Burgundians needed to regulate Roman life, Roman law. I mean, they were the, the effective rulers there, so they had to grant the right to be respected, and they created these laws that were called Roman laws of the Germanic people. That was a, a way to say, okay, we are the rulers, but we uh, basically write uh, to you a code of laws that is Roman-based, but it, it also has, and this is probably the most important thing, the, um, uh, let's say, uh, um, it has in itself essentially al already d those modifications that have occurred up to this point compared to the previous Roman law, I mean the Theodosian Code. This is extremely important because it shows that the Burgundians and the Visigoths uh, were um, already cooperating with the Roman elites at every level, even at the juridical one. I mean, the Visigoths and the Burgundians couldn't write when they arrived in there. And it was the same Romans who taught them how this had to be done, and they helped them practically in... Um, in, um, um, in even in codifying um, certain laws that weren't that were already changed from the time of the Theodosian uh, code, so basically creating uh, it was still partly um, essentially the Theodosian code, but with in w with certain meaningful differences that tell us even much about the local society. Now, how did these uh, laws interacted? I mean, how did the German law interacted and the Roman one interacted? Well, practically. Um, the Germans were judged by the German law, but generally speaking, I think they could choose uh, at a point um, to um, to be judged by the Roman law because essentially the Roman law was taking over in constitutionary law, um, and it, it soon the the ethnic difference between the Germans and the Romans ceased, and the uh, it was essentially the latter that had more importance, and. Um, I believe, uh, although here I think that also the um, uh, the um, the uh, 
the, the let's say that the model set by the ancient Germanic law was also set for populations that had not. Um, I mean, it's not a surprise that this uh, the the Lex Gundobauda had uh, such an influence on the Frankish codifications and on and the ones that the uh, Carolingians eventually made for the Saxons, because the Franks uh, and obviously f the Saxons were still much more German, uh, much more uh, they were much more German in um, juridical tradition than uh, the the, uh, the Germans of southern Gaul or or or, uh, or Spain. So basically, what the the Franks did eventually, uh, I mean, you have to think that these were all oral laws. I mean, it's not that before the Lex Ripuaria, the the, vri the writing of the Lex Ripuaria, the Franks didn't have a law. They had, but it was all oral. Um, so when it was uh, written down, obviously there were these models that had been written by the, the, the Burgundians in this case, um, that could fit for, for, for that. So it would be taken because there was the, the German model, while the, the Roman one was a bit more neglected. So that, in fact, what you see in French history is that even up to the uh, low Middle Ages, um, and beyond, actually, to the modern age, southern France had always a, a different uh, constitutionary law compared to northern France, because they were two completely different, I mean, not completely, but very different uh, juridical traditions. The southern one was much more Romanized, the northern one was much more Germ Germanized. Uh, in any case, they were an hybrid between Roman and Germanic law. So this to make the long story short, I hope to have been clear. I don't know how much, but so it is. Um, and um, uh, another very important thing that happened at this point was actually the conversion of the uh, of the Burgundians in in 517 at the national say the Burgundian Council of um, Epon. Uh, where essentially Arianism was condemned. Uh, I forgot to say the Burgundians were Arians. Uh, I don't know since when. I think when they settled into the Middle Rhine were formally already Arian. Uh, but as you see, as you understand in those cases, you know, it was just uh, a political um, thing to, to do or sit or claim. Um, and it was mostly something that um, pertained to the elites because the majority of the population was was largely still pagan. But it's very interesting how uh, eventually the Burgundians um, um, basically passed to from Arianism to Catholicism pretty pretty easily, pretty also pretty quickly. And uh, usually the Burgundians are remembered as a case of uh, of um, of direct. Um, Catholicization without uh, persecutions, without problems of uh, like it had happened instead with the Visigoths, when there were civil wars related to the fate, to I mean to the um, between the Catholics and the Arians. Even if it wasn't really about religion, it was really about a different conception of the kingdom and all uh, that eventually was won by the um, say the Roman aristocracy. It was Catholic and didn't want to be. Um, to to be subjected to a centralized Visigothic monarchy. I mean, it had, as always, religious conflicts in history have practically nothing to do with the religion itself. Um, so in the Burgundian case, it was very different, probably because it was a very intensely Romanized land. The Burgundians were probably a few, so this problem of passing to Catholicism probably neither found a, it couldn't really found a, uh, any resistance from the Burgundian side. And as we've seen um, in the uh, Burgundian family, uh, a ruling um, uh, class were plenty, especially women who had converted to Catholicism. This is very interesting because it happened also elsewhere. It's usually the, the women who convert to Catholicism. I never fully understood why. Uh, I mean, I can I can understand it in the sense that probably the 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 male uh, rulers had to be to maintain this mm, say Aryan tradition that equated to the idea that those were Aryans, that is Germans in arms, opposed to the Roman Catholicism. So it was a matter of political and military prestige in front of the Roman world. Women instead were mm, uh, much more um, engaged into forms of avergetism, into local 
into weaving, let's say, local um, relations, uh, um, um, uh, the, the um, you know, women are generally more hospitable and they, they care more about the local um, uh, relations, we can say, I mean, it, 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 it might be a stupid, uh, stupid, um, uh, thing to say, but it's pretty much obvious that think about uh, about this when these um, uh, Germanic chieftains were practically all the time at war. I mean, it was effectively their wives, their their uh, aristocratic women, who remained in there in the local population, and therefore they had to even to had to have certain diplomatic skills with local nobility and all. So they resented more of the Catholic influence. Also because they were more involved into local donations and all, so they were more, mm, um, uh, let's say, more attached to the even the the devotional practices of, of the local traditions, the monasteries that existed, especially in southern France. It was full of monasteries already at this early age. Um, without mentioning that. Um, Southern French monasticism was one of the, the produced uh, some of the highest, uh, um, uh, most highest educated people of, of Europe at the time. Um, some of the most educated scholars were monks and bishops of of, of French southern uh, of, Gaul of southern Gallic uh, cities. So the Burgundians were definitely uh, influenced by this, and uh, and they converted to uh, Catholicism without too many. Um, to many problems, uh, if not any problem uh, at all. And um, what is important about the 517 con Council of Epon is that it was also felt as a, as a sort of national council. I mean, the Burgundians were feeling themselves as finally in this also religious uh, reunion, a sort of unique um, kingdom. Uh, uh, there had been, as we've seen, the recompactation of the uh, Burgundian domains under a sole uh, ruler. So it, it definitely this council corresponded uh, to a uh, sort of political um, political stand to say, look, we we have we are both politically and religiously uh, a unitary Burgundian kingdom, which which is definitely very important. However, the fall of the Burgundian kingdom was about to happen anyway, because they were too 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 little in practice, and uh, the um, the Burgundians um, at this time actually uh, the Burgundian uh, strength uh, was probably higher than they had been in the past. In fact, the the Burgundians were had managed to expand into certain areas, also of the Val d'Aot uh, in today's uh, northwestern Italy. Um, they had progressively pushed also into uh, western Switzerland, southeastern France. So the Franks didn't like f the Franks in the north didn't like pretty much uh, how the thing was was happening, and um, uh, so basically. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the the Franks invaded the Burgundy and uh, defeated the Burgundians uh, uh, at uh, uh, at Autun after a first attempt of, at the battle of uh, of Vézerans, into which actually the Burgundians had um, um, managed to to defeat the, the Merovingians in in battle. In in this sense, the the the, the Frankish advance had been averted. Um, and um, the um, let's remember that the pr mm, that at the time, um, at this time, the the um, the the the, uh, the, mm, the Burgundian. Uh, the the last Burgundian uh, king was, um, if I'm not wrong, Godomar, mm. and the previous Burgundian king Sigismund had been actually killed by the Franks. Uh, so there was definitely this um, kind of atomic attrition that dated back to the time into which the, the Burgundians had settled into the Middle Rhine, close to the Franks. They were most mostly pro Hans, while the, the, the Franks were pro-Roman. Um, th there was this sneaky behavior 
that eventually continued against the Franks uh, even uh, when the, the Burgundians were settled by Etius into Burgundy and they had the highlight with the Visigoths and um, th th these were also Germans which means that in terms of um, mm, political and milita military ethics were extremely proud and uh, the fact that Clovis uh, had managed to subdue um, Gundobad uh, had been remained probably a burning wound for the Burgundians because uh, the Germans couldn't tolerate that someone essentially could dictate them what to do but even uh, it, uh, so th they wanted to take revenge and there is this resurgence let's say of the Burgundian national anti-Frankish prerogatives at the be beginning of 6th century that eventually is crushed by the Franks because simply the Franks were extremely more powerful than the Burgundians themselves and and uh, the, um, the the end basically the Burgundian kingdom came uh, to the uh, at this point in, in the early 30s of the 6th century. Uh, I think in conclusion um, uh, of this video I would like to reflect, I mean I could because you know that the kingdom of uh, the story of the kingdom of Burgundy, and in this sense of the, of the Burgundians or at least their descendants, who, uh, went on. I mean, the kingdom of Burgundy is something that formally finished pretty late in the middle middle ages. At a point was. Um, uh, it um, the, the the fact is that Burgundy, just like Alamannia and and uh, uh, other political entities within the, um, the let's say, the Merovingian Empire uh, survived, administratively speaking, and even nationally speaking, a certain measure, because uh, the local elites became <laughs> Francicized, but um, they, um, at the same time, were still mm, a mix between the Franks and the local aristocracies. So the Burgundians disappeared as an independent force, but the the the, the kingdom of Burgundy remained um, for actually for centuries to to come uh, uh, as a as a distinct entity. Uh, it was part of the Carolingian, uh, you know, the the, the kingdom of Burgundy. I think belonged to 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 the uh, Frankish Lotharingia. So. Uh, um, and uh, especially from the southern areas of Provence, um, in, in later times during the 10th century, was essentially the um, the attempt to recreate a sort of Burgundian kingdom, not obviously on the base of the ancient Burgundian identity. Uh, I mean, in continuity with the Burgundian kingdom of the past that didn't exist anymore, even Italy, but as a sort of proto-national. Uh, um, ensemble, because this is how things happened. It was a relatively a sort of, um, I mean, I don't know how much in today's France, Burgund uh, the regions that uh, belong to the Kingdom of Burgundy um, actually maintained um, a sort of local identity, because uh, I've always seen them as relatively fractioned, especially given the um, the political excuse me, the geographical nature of the places. But I'm pretty sure th there was some, there and still, and, and there is still some, mm, uh, some cohesion uh, related to the Burgundian past. And actually the kingdom, of, uh, there was a kingdom of Burgundy um, that survived, uh, historically speaking, think about even in the Holy Roman Empire, Burgundy was a crown. The only problem is that uh, it was a sort of puppet crown. I mean, um, now it's complicated to explain the story, but substantially um, say this, that up to the 10th, 11th century, especially the 10th century, uh, Burgundy could make it as, uh, as a unitary kingdom uh, um, in, into the uh, post-Carolingian world just like the Kingdom of Italy, the Kingdom of, of Germany, and the Kingdom of France. Um, instead, it was aborted. And it was aborted not because it lacked even the, the chances of that. Sh surely there were s certain systemic factors that evidently brought to this end. But at a certain point, um, in fr in, in today's, uh, French on today's French soil, it, it, it was actually, mm, in, in terms of um, of political future, the Kingdom of Burgundy 
was more uh, promising than the uh, the Kingdom of France. I mean, the Kingdom of the Western Franks uh, was a point to, w to which the Kingdom of Burgundy was much more solid and structured than one uh, of uh, of the uh, of the w of the one of the Western Franks in the north. Then eventually, the aristocracy basically. I mean, solid and structured is, uh, are big adjectives for the 10th century real political uh, and territorial reality. But let's say that there was potentially the, uh, the chance that this uh, kingdom could evolve into something more unitary. Instead, who m actually made it to create something more unity was the Western Frankish kingdom in the north around Paris, thanks to the political and military activity of the Counts of Paris, while the Kingdom of Burgundy basically uh, failed as a political project because of the uh, enmities uh, of the local uh, nobility that couldn't create anything uh, long-lasting uh, 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 from a certain point onwards. So the Kingdom of Burgundy actually had this um, importance that, uh, um, that evidently remarks the fact that that mm, there was an important um, let's say there were some promising bases that even had been set in the ancient Burgundian kingdom like for instance uh, the the the, uh, the lands of the Alamanni didn't become a kingdom I mean the Alam the kingdom the, the, the those were um, incorporated in the Eastern Frankish kingdom that is the kingdom of Germany um, so uh, it's interesting that this uh, fourth kingdom between Italy, France and Germany actually uh, survived uh, as a political entity and I consider it as a sort of an aborted uh, monarchy because it basically it basically was I mean there in maybe in modern history it might have been a sort of uh, um, Burgundian kingdom uh, into those Alpine lands uh, that would have existed as a sort of state on its own. Today we would talk about Burgundy as a state between, I don't know, Italy and France. Uh, I don't know, maybe with Arles as a capital or Lyon as a capital or Vienna, I don't know which. Um, another thing that is important to remember in here, because many of you will say, well, but there was actually the Duchy of Burgundy it was also pretty strong and, 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 and powerful into the mi low Middle Ages and it was eventually destroyed by the French, sure. Um, but that's not really um, a uh, successor of Burgundy because uh, I I it's just a name that continues that. Uh, it's, um, it's important to tell the story because uh, I Burgundy, the one of the um, Valois-Bourgogne dynasty, the one of um, uh, Charles the Bold, for instance, and uh, that eventually uh, m intermarried with the Habsburgs and gave origin to the Habsburg um, um, lowlands in, in Flanders, etc., was not really a, a Burgundian emanation. It didn't become, it, it didn't originate feudally from uh, the ancient um, Burgundian kingdom that existed institutionally into the Holy Roman Empire. Because, by the way, those were lands that belonged to the Holy Roman Empire um, up to very late in time, um, the um, in the Middle Ages, and eventually they were conquered by the French, etc. What we talk about the um, uh, uh, when we uh, when we look at mm, at low medieval Burgundy is a whole different thing, uh, because low medieval Burgundy was originated by the Duchy of Burgundy. That was a duchy of uh, probably originally a county, I don't know, uh, but it was originally a duchy of the uh, belonging to territorially and juridically to the f uh, to the w uh, to the French kingdom, to the Western Frankish kingdom. It is true that I think um, I'm not sure whether the Duchy of Burgundy proper was was still um, geographically speaking part of the old Burgundian domains. I'm not sure whether, surely not juridically at that point anymore, but geographically it was, but there is no continuity to that. Eventually the duchy was um, seized by the Valois dynasty and from the duchy of Burgundy they began uh, into the 14th and 15th century 
uh, to ex uh, this dynasty to expand into towards the north, towards the Flanders, into this area also between uh, France and, and Germany, etc. And it created this very powerful entity that we know as Low Medieval Burgundy. It was one of the greatest, most advanced counters of the time. But it has nothing to do with the old Burgundy from a juridical point of view. And nor a political one, so it has nothing to do with that because it was a French thing. While Burgundy was a thing on its own, it was not French, it was Burgundy proper, and it was part of the Holy Roman Empire. Instead, the Duchy of Burgundy originated from the, uh, the Kingdom of France. It is a, a wholly different, well different thing. Um, uh, but uh, it's still important to, to understand that even in the, um, the Burgundian history uh, has been very important because even in the low middle ages there has always been a great political gaming taking place at the frontiers of the of today's French territory between the areas of uh, Swabia in Germany, uh, Switzerland, Savoy, uh, this area of Burgundy, then the French Burgundy and all, where there was a lot of political gaming, especially the Habsburgs of the early days built up their domains thanks to the interaction in those places. Those were the same places where the Savoy actually built up their own um, their own power. Uh, the Savoy were originated from the Ascaric mark of, of Ivrea in Piedmont and the accounts uh, of... Uh, actually, that descended actually from the kings of Burgundy in some way, so there is maybe in Savoy, historically speaking, a bit more uh, of a continuity with Burgundy, but it's not really overlapping at all. So it, the, the Burgundy really finished into the 11th century as a, as a feasible Auton um, let's say independent or autonomous as you want to s see it in the, into the frame, institutional frame of the Holy Roman Empire political entity. It was kind of revived because there was the need of attaching a crown to, to that land so it, would, it was easier to control but in practice it never led to any unitary domain in there. So that's it. But f for the Burgundians I think today uh, it's enough. And uh, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested to receive further news about my contents. For now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you once again a, a happy 2019. And uh, see you next time. Bye.